section eight of a far country by winston churchill this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter eight on the wednesday of that same week the news of my father's sudden and serious illness came to me in a telegram and by the time i arrived at home it was too late to see him again alive it was my first experience with death and what perplexed me continually during the following days was an inability to feel the loss more deeply when a child i had been easily shaken by the spectacle of sorrow had i during recent years as a result of a discovery that emotions arising from human relationships lead to discomfort and suffering deliberately been forming a shell until now i was incapable of natural feelings of late i had seemed closer to my father and his letters though formal had given evidence of his affection in his repressed fashion he had made it clear that he looked forward to the time when i was to practice with him why was it then as i gazed upon his fine features in death that i experienced no intensity of sorrow what was it in me that would not break down he seemed worn and tired yet i had never thought of him as weary never attributed to him any yearning and now he was released i wonder what had been his private thoughts about himself his private opinions about life and when i reflect now upon my lack of real knowledge at five-and-twenty i am amazed at the futility of an expensive education which had failed to impress upon me the simple basic fact that life was struggle that either development or retrogression is the fate of all men that characters are never completely made but always in the making I had merely a disconcerting glimpse of this truth, with no powers of formulation, as I sat beside my mother in the bedroom, where every article evoked some childhood scene. Here was the dent in the walnut footboard of the bed, made one wintry day by the impact of my box of blocks, the big armchair covered with i know not what stiff embroidery which had served on countless occasions as a chariot driven to victory i even remembered how every wednesday morning i had been banished from the room which had been so large a part of my childhood universe when ella the housemaid had flung open all its windows and crowded its furniture into the hall the thought of my wanderings since then became poignant almost terrifying the room with all its memories was unchanged how safe i had been within its walls why could i not have been content with what it represented of tradition of custom of religion and what was it within me that had lured me away from these i was miserable indeed but my misery was not of the kind i thought it ought to be at moments when my mother relapsed into weeping i glanced at her almost in wonder such sorrow as hers was incomprehensible once she surprised and discomfited me by lifting her head and gazing fixedly at me through her tears I recall certain impressions of the funeral. There, among the pallbearers, was my cousin, Robert Breck, tears in the furrows of his cheeks. Had he loved my father more than I? The sight of his grief moved me suddenly and strongly. It seemed an age since I had worked in his store, and yet here he was still, coming to town every morning and returning every evening to claremore loving his friends and mourning them one by one was this the spectacle presented by my cousin robert the reward of earthly existence were there no other prizes save those known as greatness of character and depth of human affections cousin robert looked worn and old the other pallbearers men of weight 
of long standing in the community were aged too mr blackwood and mr jules hollister and out of place somehow in this new church building it came to me abruptly that the old order was gone had slipped away during my absence the church i had known in boyhood had been torn down to make room for a business building on boyne street the edifice in which i sat was expensive gave forth no distinctive note seemed transitory with its hybrid interior its shiny oak and blue and red organ pipes betokening uncompromised and weakened faith nondescript likewise seemed the new minister mr randlett as he prayed unctuously in front of the flowers massed on the platform i vaguely resented his laudatory references to my father the old church with its severity had actually stood for something it was the westminster catechism in wood and stone and dr pound had been the human incarnation of that catechism the fit representative of a wrathful god a militant shepherd who had guarded with vigilance his respectable flock who had protested vehemently against the sins of the world by which they were surrounded against the dogs and sorcerers and whoremongerers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie how dr pound would have put the emphasis on the everlasting into those words against what was mr randlett protesting my glance wandered to the pews which held the committees from various organizations such as the chamber of commerce and the bar association which had come to do honor to my father and there differentiated from the others i saw the spruce alert figure of theodore watling he too represented a new type and a new note this time a forceful note a secular note that had not belonged to the old church and seemed likewise anomalistic in the new during the long slow journey in the carriage to the cemetery my mother did not raise her veil it was not until she reached out and seized my hand convulsively that i realized she was still a part of my existence in the days that followed i became aware that my father's death had removed a restrictive element that i was free now to take without criticism or opposition whatever course in life i might desire it may be that i had apprehended even then that his professional ideals would not have coincided with my own mingled with this sense of emancipation was a curious feeling of regret of mourning for something i had never valued something fixed and dependable for which he had stood a rock and a refuge of which i had never availed myself when his will was opened it was found that the property had been left to my mother during her lifetime it was larger than i had thought four hundred thousand dollars shrewdly invested for the most part in city real estate my father had been very secretive as to money matters and my mother had no interest in them three or four days later i received in the mail a typewritten letter signed by theodore watling expressing sympathy for my bereavement and asking me to drop in on him downtown before i should leave the city in contrast to the somewhat dingy offices where my father had practised in the blackwood block the quarters of watling founds and ripon on the eighth floor of the new durrett building were modern to a degree finished in oak and floored with marble with a railed-off space where young women with nimble fingers played ceaselessly on typewriters one of them informed me that mr watling was busy but on reading my card added that she would take it in meanwhile in company with two others who may have been clients i waited 
this then was what it meant to be a lawyer of importance to have like a chesterfield an ante-room where clients cooled their heels and awaited one's pleasure the young woman returned and led me through a corridor to a door on which was painted mr watling i recall him tilted back in his chair in a debonair manner beside his polished desk the hint of a smile on his lips and leaning close to him was a yellow owl-like person whose eyes as they turned to me gave the impression of having stared for years into hard artificial lights mr watling rose briskly how are you hugh he said the warmth of his greeting tempered by just the note of condolence suitable to my black clothes i'm glad you came i wanted to see you before you went back to cambridge i must introduce you to judge baring of our state supreme court judge this is mr parrott's boy the judge looked me over with a certain slow impressiveness and gave me a soft and fleshy hand glad to know you mr parrott your father was a great loss to our bar he declared i detected in his tone and manner a slight reservation that could not be called precisely judicial dignity it was as though in these few words he had gone to the limit of self-commitment with a stranger a striking contrast to the confidential attitude towards mr watling in which i had surprised him judge said mr watling sitting down again do you recall that time we all went up to mr parrott's house and tried to induce him to run for mayor that was before you went on the lower bench the judge nodded gloomily caressing his watch chain and suddenly rose to go that would be all right then mr watling inquired cryptically with a smile the other made a barely perceptible inclination of the head and departed mr watling looked at me he's one of the best men we have on the bench to-day he added there was a trace of apology in his tone we talked a while of my father to whom so he said he had looked up ever since he had been admitted to the bar it would be a pleasure to me hugh as well as a matter of pride he said cordially but with dignity to have matthew parrott's son in my office i suppose you will be wishing to take your mother somewhere this summer but if you care to come here in the autumn you will be welcome you will begin of course as other young men begin as i began but i am a believer in blood and i'll be glad to have you mr founds and mr ripon feel the same way he escorted me to the door himself everywhere i went during that brief visit home i was struck by change by the crumbling and decay of institutions that once had held me in thrall by the superimposition of a new order that as yet had assumed no definite character some of the old landmarks had disappeared there were new and aggressive office buildings new and aggressive residences new and aggressive citizens who lived in them and of whom my mother spoke with gentle deprecation even claremore that paradise of my childhood had grown shrivelled and shabby even tawdry i thought when we went out there one sunday afternoon all that once represented the magic word country had vanished the old flat piano made in philadelphia ages ago the horsehair chairs and sofa had been replaced by a nondescript furniture of the sort displayed behind plate-glass windows of the city's stores rocking chairs on stands upholstered in clashing colours their coiled springs only half hidden by tassels and ornamental electric fixtures instead of the polished coal-oil lamps cousin jenny had grown white willie was a staid bachelor helen an old maid while mary had married a tall anemic young man with glasses walter kinley whom cousin robert had taken into the store as i contemplated the brecks odd questions suggested themselves 
did honesty and warm-heartedness necessarily accompany a lack of artistic taste and was virtue its own reward after all they drew my mother into the house took off her wraps set her down in the most comfortable rocker and insisted on making her a cup of tea i was touched i loved them still and yet i was conscious of reservations concerning them they too seemed a little on the defensive with me and once in a while mary was caustic in her remarks i guess nothing but new york will be good enough for hugh now he'll be taking cousin sarah away from us not at all my dear said my mother gently he's going into mr watling's office next autumn theodore watling demanded cousin robert pausing in his carving yes robert mr watling has been good enough to say that he would like to have you is there anything oh i'm out of date sarah cousin robert replied vigorously severing the leg of the turkey those modern lawyers are too smart for me watling's no worse than the others i suppose only he's got more ability i've never heard anything against him said my mother in a pained voice only the other day macallary willett congratulated me that hugh was going to be with him you mustn't mind robert sarah put in cousin jenny a remark reminiscent of other days dad has a notion that his generation is the only honest one said helen laughingly as she passed a plate i had gained a sense of superiority and i was quite indifferent to cousin robert's opinion of mr watling of modern lawyers in general more than once a wave of self-congratulation surged through me that i had possessed the foresight and initiative to get out of the wholesale grocery business while there was yet time i looked at willie still freckled still literal still a plodder at walter kinley and i thought of the drabness of their lives at cousin robert himself as he sat smoking his cigar in the bay window on that dark february day and suddenly i pitied him the suspicion struck me that he had not prospered of late and this deepened to a conviction as he talked the republican party is going to the dogs he asserted it used to be an honourable party but now it is no better than the other politics are only conducted now for the purpose of making unscrupulous men rich sir for years i have furnished this city with good groceries if i do say it myself i took a pride in the fact that the inmates of the hospitals yes and the dependent poor in the city's institutions should have honest food you can get anything out of the city if you are willing to pay the politicians for it i lost my city contracts why because i refused to deal with scoundrels wheel and company and other unscrupulous upstarts are willing to do so and poison the poor and the sick with adulterated groceries the first thing i knew was that the city auditor was holding back my bills for supplies and paying wheels that's what politics and business yes sir and the law have come to in these days if a man wants to succeed he must turn into a rascal i was not shocked but i was silent uncomfortable wishing that it were time to take the train back to the city cousin robert's face was more worn than i had thought and i contrasted him inevitably with the forceful person who used to stand in his worn alpaca coat on the pavement in front of his store greeting with clear-eyed content his fellow merchants of the city willie breck too was silent and walter kinley took off his glasses and wiped them in the meanwhile 
helen had left the group in which my mother sat and approaching us laid her hands on her father's shoulders now dad she said in affectionate remonstrance you're excited about politics again and you know it isn't good for you and besides they're not worth it you're right helen he replied under the pressure of her hands he made a strong effort to control himself and turned to address my mother across the room i'm getting to be a crotchety old man he said it's a good thing i have a daughter to remind me of it it is a good thing robert said my mother during the rest of our visit he seemed to have recovered something of his former spirits and poise taking refuge in the past they talked of their own youth of families whose houses had been landmarks on the second bank i'm worried about your cousin robert hugh my mother confided to me when we were at length seated in the train i've heard rumors that things are not so well at the store as they might be we looked out at the winter landscape so different from that one which had thrilled every fibre of my being in the days when the railroad on which we travelled had been a winding narrow gauge the orchards those that remained were bare stubble pricked the frozen ground where tassels had once waved in the hot summer wind we fled by row after row of gingerbread suburban houses built on villa plots and i read in large letters on a hideous signboard woodbine park hugh have you ever heard anything against mr watling no mother i said so far as i knew he is very much looked up to by lawyers and business men he is counsel i believe for mr blackwood's street car line on boyne street and i told you i believe that i met him once at mr kimes poor robert she sighed i suppose business trouble does make one bitter i've seen it so often but i never imagined that it would overtake robert and at his time of life it is an old and respected firm and we have always had pride in it that night when i was going to bed it was evident that the subject was still in her mind she clung to my hand a moment i too am afraid of the new hugh she said a little tremulously we all grow so as age comes on but you're not old mother i protested I have a feeling, since your father is gone, that I have lived my life, my dear, though I'd like to stay long enough to see you married, to have grandchildren. I was not young when you were born. And she added, after a little while, I know nothing about business affairs, and now, now that your father is no longer here, sometimes I'm afraid afraid of what mother she tried to smile at me through her tears we were in the old sitting-room surrounded by the books i know it's foolish and it isn't that i don't trust you i know that the son of your father couldn't do anything that was not honourable and yet i am afraid of what the world is becoming the city is growing so fast and so many new people are coming in things are not the same robert is right there and i have heard your father say the same thing hugh promise me that you will try to remember always what he was and what he would wish you to be i will mother i answered but i think you would find that cousin robert exaggerates a little makes things seem worse than they really are customs change you know and politics were never well sunday schools i too smiled a little father knew that 
and he would never take an active part in them he was too fine she exclaimed and now i continued cousin robert has happened to come in contact with them through business that is what has made the difference in him before he always knew they were corrupt but he rarely thought about them hugh she said suddenly after a pause you must remember one thing that you can afford to be independent i thank god that your father has provided for that i was duly admitted the next autumn to the bar of my own state and was assigned to a desk in the offices of watling founds and ripon larry weed was my immediate senior among the apprentices and larry was a hero worshipper i can see him now he suggested a bullfrog as he sat in the little room we shared in common his arms akimbo over a law book his little legs doubled under him his round eyes fixed expectantly on the doorway and even if i had not been aware of my good fortune in being connected with such a firm as theodore watling's larry would shortly have brought it home to me during those weeks when i was making my first desperate attempts at briefing up the law i was sometimes interrupted by his exclamations when certain figures went by in the corridor say hugh do you know who that was no miller gorse who's he do you mean to say you never heard of miller gorse i've been away a long time i would answer apologetically a person of some importance among my contemporaries at harvard i had looked forward to a residence in my native city with the complacency of one who has seen something of the world only to find that i was the least in the new kingdom and it was a kingdom larry opened up to me something of the significance and extent of it something of the identity of the men who controlled it miller gorse he said impressively is the counsel for the railroad what railroad you mean the i was adding when he interrupted me pityingly after you've been here a while you'll find out there's only one railroad in this state so far as politics are concerned the ashuela and northern the lake shore and the others don't count i refrained from asking any more questions at that time but afterwards i always thought of the railroad as spelled with a capital miller gorse isn't forty yet larry told me on another occasion that's doing pretty well for a man who comes near running this state for the sake of acquiring knowledge i endured mr weed's patronage i inquired how mr gorse ran the state oh you'll find out soon enough he assured me but mr barber's president of the railroad sure once in a while they take something up to him but as a rule he leaves things to gorse whereupon i resolved to have a good look at mr gorse at the first opportunity one day mr watling sent out for some papers he's in there now said larry you take em in there meant mr watling's sanctum and in there he was i had only a glance at the great man for with a kindly but preoccupied thank you hugh mr watling took the papers and dismissed me heaviness blackness and impassivity these were the impressions of mr gorse which i carried away from that first meeting the very solidity of his flesh seemed to suggest the solidity of his position such say the psychologists is the effect of prestige i remember well an old-fashioned picture puzzle in one of my boyhood books the scene depicted was to all appearances a sylvan peaceful one with two happy lovers seated on a log beside a brook but presently 
as one gazed at the picture the head of an animal stood forth among the branches and then the body more animals began to appear bit by bit a tiger a bear a lion a jackal a fox until at last whenever i looked at the page i did not see the sylvan scene at all but only the predatory beasts of the forest so one by one the figures of the real rulers of the city superimposed themselves for me upon the simple and democratic design of mayor council board of aldermen police force etc that filled the eye of a naive and trusting electorate which fondly imagined that it had something to say in government miller gorse was one of these rulers behind the screen and adolf scherer of the boyne ironworks another there was leonard dickinson of the corn national bank frederick grierson becoming wealthy in city real estate judah b talent who though outlawed socially was deferred to as the owner of the morning era and even ralph hambleton rapidly superseding the elderly and conservative mr lord who had hitherto managed the great hambleton estate ralph seemed to have become in a somewhat gnostic manner a full-fledged financier not having studied law he had been home for four years when i became a legal fledgling and during the early days of my apprenticeship i was beholden to him for many eye-openers concerning the conduct of great affairs i remember him sauntering into my room one morning when larry weed had gone out on an errand hello hughie he said with his air of having nothing to do grinding it out where's watling isn't he in his office no well what can i do for you i asked ralph grinned perhaps i'll tell you when you're a little older you're too young and he sank down into larry wee's chair his long legs protruding on the other side of the table it's a matter of taxes some time ago i found out that dickinson and talent and others i could mention we're paying a good deal less on their city property than we are we don't propose to do it any more that's all how can mr watling help you i inquired well i don't mind giving you a few tips about your profession hughie i'm going to get watling to fix it up with the city hall gang old lord doesn't like it i'll admit and when i told him we had been contributing to the city long enough that i proposed swinging into line with other property holders he began to blubber about disgrace and what my grandfather would say if he were alive well he isn't alive a good deal of water has flowed under the bridges since his day it's a mere matter of business of getting your respectable firm to retain a city hall attorney to fix it up with the assessor how about the penitentiary i ventured not too seriously i shan't go to the penitentiary neither will watling what i do is pay a lawyer's fee there isn't anything criminal in that is there for some time after ralph had departed i sat reflecting upon this new knowledge and there came into my mind the bitterness of cousin robert breck against this city hall gang and his remarks about lawyers i recalled the tone in which he had referred to mr watling but ralph's philosophy easily triumphed why not be practical and become master of a situation which one had not made and could not alter instead of being overwhelmed by it needless to say i did not mention the conversation to mr watling nor did he dwindle in my estimation these necessary transactions did not interfere in any way with his personal relationships and his days were filled with kindnesses and was not mr ripon the junior partner one of the evangelical lights of the community conducting advanced bible classes every week in the church of the redemption 
the unfolding of mysteries kept me alert and i understood that if i was to succeed certain esoteric knowledge must be acquired as it were unofficially i kept my eyes and ears opened and applied myself with all industry to the routine tasks with which every young man in a large legal firm is familiar i recalled distinctly my pride when the board of aldermen having passed an ordinance lowering the water rates i was entrusted with the responsibility of going before the court in behalf of mr ogilvy's water company obtaining a temporary restricting order preventing the ordinance from going at once into effect here was an affair in point were it not for lawyers of the calibre of watling founds and ripon hard-earned private property would soon be confiscated by the rapacious horde once in a while i was made aware that mr watling had his eye on me well hugh he would say how are you getting along that's right stick to it and after a while we'll hand the drudgery over to somebody else he possessed the supreme quality of a leader of men in that he took pains to inform himself concerning the work of the least of his subordinates and he had the gift of putting fire into a young man by a word or a touch of the hand on the shoulder it was not difficult for me therefore to comprehend larry weed's hero worship the loyalty of other members of the firm or of those occupants of the office whom i have not mentioned my first impression of him which i had got at jerry kimes deepened as time went on and i readily shared the belief of those around me that his legal talents easily surpassed those of any of his contemporaries i can recall at this time several noted cases in the city when i sat in court listening to his arguments with thrills of pride he made us all feel no matter how humble may have been our contributions to the preparation that we had a share in his triumphs we remembered his manner with judges and juries and strove to emulate it he spoke as if there could be no question as to his being right as to the law and the facts and yet in some subtle way that baited analysis managed not to antagonize the court victory was in the air in that office i do not mean to say there were not defeats but frequently these defeats by resourcefulness by a never say die spirit by a consummate knowledge not only of the law but of other things at which i have hinted were turned into ultimate victories we fought cases from one court to another until our opponents were worn out or the decision was reversed we won and that spirit of winning got into the blood what was most impressed on me in those early years i think was the discovery that there was always a path if one were clever enough to find it from one terrace to the next higher staying power was the most prized of all the virtues one could always by adroitness compel a legal opponent to fight the matter out all over again on new ground or at least on ground partially new if the court of appeal should fail one there was the supreme court there was the opportunity also to shift from the state to the federal courts and likewise the much prized device known as a change of venue when a judge was supposed to be prejudiced end of section eight section nine of a far country by winston churchill this librivox recording is in the public domain book one chapter nine as my apprenticeship advanced i grew more and more to separate the inhabitants of our city into two kinds the efficient who were served and the inefficient who were neglected 
but the mental process of which the classification was the result was not so deliberate as may be supposed sometimes when an important client would get into trouble the affair took me into the police court where i saw the riff-raff of the city penned up waiting to have justice doled out to them weary women who had spent the night in cells indifferent now as to the front they presented to the world the finery ruffled that they had tended so carefully to catch the eyes of men on the darkened streets brazen young girls who blazed forth defiance to all order derelict men sodden and helpless with scrubby beards shifty-looking burglars and pickpockets all these i beheld at first with twinges of pity later to mask them with the ugly and inevitable with whom society had to deal somehow lawyers after all must be practical men i came to know the justices of these police courts as well as other judges and underlying my acquaintance with all of them was the knowledge though not on the threshold of my consciousness that they depended for their living every man of them those who were appointed and those who were elected upon a political organization which derived its sustenance from the element whence came our clients thus by degrees the sense of belonging to a special priesthood had grown on me i recall an experience with that same mr nathan wheel the wholesale grocer of whose commerce with the city hall my cousin robert breck had so bitterly complained late one afternoon mr wheel's carriage ran over a child on its way up town through one of the poorer districts the parents naturally were frantic and the coachman was arrested this was late in the afternoon and i was alone in the office when the telephone rang hurrying to the police station i found mr wheel in a state of excitement and abject fear for an ugly crowd had gathered outside could not mr watling or mr founds come demanded the grocer with an inner contempt for the layman's state of mind on such occasions i assured him of my competency to handle the case he was impressed i think by the sergeant's deference who knew what it meant to have such an office as ours interfere with the affair i called up the prosecuting attorney who sent to monahan's saloon close by and procured a release for the coachman on his own recognizance one of many signed in blank and left there by the justice for privileged cases the coachman was hustled out by a back door and the crowd dispersed the next morning while a score or more of delinquents sat in the anxious seats justice gary recognized me and gave me precedence and mr wheel with a sigh of relief paid his fine mr parrot is it he asked as we stood together for a moment on the sidewalk outside the court you've managed this well i will remember he was sued of course when he came to the office he insisted on discussing the case with mr watling who sent for me that is a bright young man mr wheel declared shaking my hand he will get on some day said mr watling he may save you a lot of money wheel when my friend mr watling is united states senator eh mr watling laughed before that i hope i advise you to compromise this suit wheel he added how would a thousand dollars strike you i've had parrot look up the case and he tells me the little girl has had to have an operation a thousand dollars cried the grocer what right have these people to let their children play on the streets it's an outrage where else have the children to play mr watling touched his arm wheel he said gently suppose it had been your little girl the grocer pulled out his handkerchief and mopped his bald forehead but he rallied a little you fight these damaged cases for the street railroads all through the courts yes mr watling agreed but there a principle is involved if the railroads once got into the way of paying damages for every careless employee they would soon be bankrupt through blackmail 
but here you have a child whose father is a poor janitor and can't afford sickness and your coachman i imagine will be more particular in the future in the end mr wheel made out a cheque and departed in a good humour convinced that he was well out of the matter here was one of the many instances i could cite of mr watling's tenderness of heart i felt moreover as if he had done me a personal favour since it was i who had recommended the compromise for i had been to the hospital and had seen the child on the cot a dark little thing lying still in her pain with the bewildered look of a wounded animal not long after this incident of mr wheel's damage suit i obtained a more or less definite promotion by the departure of larry weed he had suddenly developed a weakness of the lungs mr watling got him a place in denver and paid his expenses west the first six or seven years i spent in the office of watling founds and ripon were of importance to my future career but there is little to relate of them i was absorbed not only in learning law but in acquiring that esoteric knowledge at which i have hinted not to be had from my seniors and which i was convinced was indispensable to a successful and lucrative practice my former comparison of the organization of our city to a picture puzzle wherein the dominating figures became visible only after long study is rather inadequate a better analogy would be the human anatomy we lawyers of course were the brains the financial and industrial interests the body helpless without us the city hall politicians the stomach that must continually be fed all three law politics and business were interdependent united by a nervous system too complex to be developed here in these years though i worked hard and often late i still found time for convivialities for social gaieties yet little by little without realizing the fact i was losing zest for the companionship of my former intimates my mind was becoming polarized by the contemplation of one object success and to it human ties were unconsciously being sacrificed tom peters began to feel this even at a time when i believed myself still to be genuinely fond of him considering our respective temperaments in youth it is curious that he should have been the first to fall in love and marry one day he astonished me by announcing his engagement to susan blackwood that ends the liquor hughie he told me beamingly i promised her i'd eliminate it he did eliminate it save for mild relapses on festive occasions a more seemingly incongruous marriage could scarcely be imagined and yet it was a success from the start from a slim silent self-willed girl susan had grown up into a tall rather raw-boned and energetic young woman she was what we called in those days intellectual and had gone in for kindergartens and after her marriage she turned out to be excessively domestic practising her theories with entire success upon a family that showed a tendency to increase at an alarming rate tom needless to say did not become intellectual he settled down prematurely i thought into what is known as a family man curiously content with the income he derived from the commission business and with life in general and he developed a somewhat critical view of the tendencies of the civilization by which he was surrounded susan held it also but she said less about it in the comfortable but unpretentious house they rented on cedar street we had many discussions after the babies had been put to bed and the door of the living-room closed in order that our voices might not reach the nursery perry blackwood now tom's brother-in-law was often there he too had lapsed into what i thought was an odd conservatism old josiah his father being dead he occupied himself mainly with looking after certain family interests among which was the boyne street car line among business men he was already getting the reputation of being a little difficult to deal with i was often the subject of their banter and presently i began to suspect 
that they regarded my career and beliefs with some concern this gave me no uneasiness though at times i lost my temper i realized their affection for me but privately i regarded them as lacking in ambition in force in the fighting qualities necessary for achievement in this modern age perhaps unconsciously i pitied them a little how is judah b to-day hughie tom would inquire i hear you've put him up for the boying club now that mr watling has got him out of that libel suit carter ives is dead perry would add sarcastically let bygones be bygones it was well known that mr tallant in the early days of his newspaper had blackmailed mr ives out of some hundred thousand dollars and that this more than any other act stood in the way with certain recalcitrant gentlemen of his highest ambition membership in the boyne the trouble with you fellows is that you refuse to deal with conditions as you find them i retorted we didn't make them and we can't change them talent's a factor in the business life of this city and he has to be counted with tom would shake his head exasperatingly why don't you get after ralph i demanded he doesn't antagonize talent either ralph's hopeless said tom he was born a pirate you weren't hughie we think there's a chance for his salvation don't we perry i refused to accept the remark as flattering another object of their assaults was frederick grierson who by this time had emerged from obscurity as a small dealer in real estate into a manipulator of blocks and corners i suppose you think it's a lawyer's business to demand an ethical bill of health of every client i said i won't stand up for all of talent's career of course but mr watling has a clear right to take his cases as for grierson it seems to me that's a matter of giving a dog a bad name just because his people weren't known here and because he has worked up from small beginnings to get down to hard pan you fellows don't believe in democracy in giving every man a chance to show what's in him democracy is good exclaimed perry if the kind of thing we're coming to is democracy god save the state on the other hand i found myself drawing closer to ralph hambleton sometimes present at these debates as the only one of my boyhood friends who seemed to be able to deal with conditions as he found them indeed he gave one the impression that if he had had the making of them he would not have changed them what the deuce do you expect i once heard him inquire with good-natured contempt business isn't charity it's war there are certain things maintained perry stoutly that gentlemen won't do gentlemen exclaimed ralph stretching his slim six feet two we were sitting in the boyne club it's ungentlemanly to kill or burn a town or sink a ship but we keep armies and navies for the purpose for a man with a good mind perry you show a surprising inability to think things out to a logical conclusion what the deuce is competition when you come down to it christianity not by a long shot if our nations are slaughtering men in starving populations in other countries are carried on in fact for the sake of business if our churches are filled with business men and our sky pilots pray for the government you can't expect heathen individuals like me to do business on a christian basis if there is such a thing you can make rules for croquet but not for a game that is based on the natural law of the survival of the fittest the darn fools in the legislatures try it occasionally but we all know it's a sop to the common people ask hughie here if there ever was a law put on the statute books that his friend watling couldn't get round why you've got competition even among the churches yours where i believe you teach in the sunday school would go bankrupt if it proclaimed real christianity and you'll go bankrupt if you practice it perry my boy some early wide-awake competitive red-blooded bird will relieve you of the boyne street car line it was one of this same new and fittest species who had already relieved poor mr mcillary willett of his fortune 
mr willett was a trusting soul who had never known how to take care of himself or his money people said and now that he had lost it they blamed him some had been saved enough for him and nancy to live on in the old house with careful economy it was nancy who managed the economy who accomplished remarkable things with a sum they would have deemed poverty in former days her mother had died while i was at cambridge reverses did not subdue mr willett's spirits and the fascination modern business had for him seemed to grow in proportion to the misfortunes it had caused him he had moved into a tiny office in the durrett building where he appeared every morning about half-past ten to occupy himself with heaven knows what shortcuts to wealth with prospectuses of companies in mexico or central america or some other distant place once i remember it was a tea company in which he tried to interest his friends to raise in the south a product he maintained would surpass orange pico in the afternoon between three and four he would turn up at the boing club as well groomed as spruce as ever generally with a flower in his buttonhole he never forgot that he was a gentleman and he had a gentleman's notions of the fitness of things and it was against his principles to use a gentleman's club for the furtherance of his various enterprises drop into my office some day dickinson he would say i think i've got something there that might interest you he reminded me when i met him that he had always predicted i would get along in life the portrait of nancy at this period is not so easily drawn the decline of the family fortunes seemed to have had as little effect upon her as upon her father although their characters differed sharply something of that spontaneity of that love of life and joy in it she had possessed in youth she must have inherited from mcillary willett but these qualities had disappeared in her long before the coming of financial reverses she was nearing thirty and in spite of her beauty and the rarer distinction that can best be described as breeding she had never married men admired her but from a distance she kept them at arm's length they said strangers who visited the city invariably picked her out of an assembly and asked who she was one man from new york who came to visit ralph and who had been madly in love with her she had amazed many people by refusing spurning all he might have given her this incident seemed a refutation of the charge that she was calculating as might have been foretold she had the social gift in a remarkable degree and in spite of the limitations of her purse the knack of dressing better than other women though at that time the organization of our social life still remained comparatively simple the custom of luxurious and expensive entertainment not having yet set in the more i reflect upon those days the more surprising does it seem that i was not in love with her it may be that i was unconsciously for she troubled my thoughts occasionally and she represented all the qualities i admired in her sex the situation that had existed at the time of our first and only quarrel had been reversed i was on the high road to the worldly success i had then resolved upon nancy was poor and for that reason perhaps prouder than ever if she was inaccessible to others she had the air of being peculiarly inaccessible to me the more so because some of the superficial relics of our intimacy remained or rather had been restored her very manner of camaraderie seemed paradoxically to increase the distance between us it piqued me had she given me the least encouragement i am sure i should have responded and i remember that i used occasionally to speculate as to whether she still cared for me and took this method of hiding her real feelings yet on the whole i felt a certain complacency about it all i knew that suffering was disagreeable i had learned how to avoid it and i may have had deep within me a feeling that i might marry her after all meanwhile my life was full and gave promise of becoming even fuller more absorbing and exciting in the immediate future 
one of the most fascinating figures to me of that order being woven like a cloth of gold out of our hitherto drab civilization an order into which i was ready and eager to be initiated was that of adolf scherer the giant german immigrant at the head of the boyne ironworks his life would easily lend itself to riotous romance in the old country in a valley below the castle perched on the rock above he had begun life by tending his father's geese what a contrast to steel town with its smells and sickening summer heat to the shanty where mrs scherer took boarders and bent over the wash-tub she too was an immigrant but lived to hear her native wagner from her own box at covent garden and he to explain on the deck of an imperial yacht to the man who might have been his sovereign certain processes in the manufacture of steel hitherto untried on that side of the atlantic in comparison with adolf scherer citizen of a once despised democracy the minor prince in whose dominions he had once tended geese was of small account indeed the adolf scherer of that day though it is not so long ago as time flies was even more solid and impressive than the man he afterwards became when he reached the dizzier heights from which he delivered to an eager press opinions on politics and war eugenics and women's suffrage and other subjects that are the despair of specialists had he stuck to steel he would have remained invulnerable but even then he was beginning to abandon the field of production for that of exploitation figuratively speaking he had taken to soap which with the aid of water may be blown into beautiful iridescent bubbles to charm the eye much good soap apparently has gone that way never to be recovered everybody who was anybody began to blow bubbles about that time and the bigger the bubble the greater its attraction for investors of hard-earned savings outside of this love for financial iridescence let it be called mr scherer seemed to care little then for a glitter of any sort shortly after his elevation to the presidency of the boyne ironworks he had been elected a member of the boyne club an honour of which some thought he should have been more sensible but generally when in town he preferred to lunch at a little german restaurant annexed to a saloon where i used often to find him literally towering above the cloth for he was a giant with short legs his napkin tucked into his shirt front engaged in lively conversation with the ministering heinrich the chef at the club mr scherer insisted could produce nothing equal to heinrich's sauerkraut and sausage my earliest relationship with mr scherer was that of an errand boy of bringing to him for his approval papers which might not be entrusted to a common messenger his gruffness and brevity disturbed me more than i cared to confess i was pretty sure that he eyed me with the disposition of the self-made to believe that college educations and good tailors were the heaviest handicaps with which a young man could be burdened and i suspected him of an inimical attitude toward the older families of the city certain men possessed his confidence and he had built as it were a stockade about them sternly keeping the rest of the world outside in theodore watling he had a childlike faith thus i studied him with a deliberation which it is the purpose of these chapters to confess though he little knew that he was being made the subject of analysis nor did i ever venture to talk with him but held strictly to my role of errand boy even after the conviction came over me that he was no longer indifferent to my presence the day arrived after some years when he suddenly thrust toward me a big hairy hand that held the document he was examining who drew this mr parrot he demanded mr ripon i told him the boyne works were buying up coal mines and this was a contract looking to the purchase of one in putnam county provided after a certain period of working the yield and quality should come up to specifications 
mr scherer requested me to read one of the sections which puzzled him and in explaining it an idea flashed over me do you mind my making a suggestion mr scherer i ventured what is it he asked brusquely i showed him how by the alteration of a few words the difficulty to which he had referred could not only be eliminated but that certain possible penalties might be evaded while the apparent meaning of the section remained unchanged in other words it gave the boy in ironworks an advantage that was not contemplated he seized the paper stared at what i had written in pencil on the margin and stared at me abruptly he began to laugh ask mr watling what he thinks of it i intended to provided it had your approval sir i replied you have my approval mr parrot he declared rather cryptically and with the slight german hardening of the v's into which he relapsed at time bring it to the verks this afternoon mr watling agreed to the alteration he looked at me amusedly yes i think that's an improvement hugh he said i had a feeling that i had gained ground and from this time on i thought i detected a change in his attitude toward me there could be no doubt about the new attitude of mr scherer who would often greet me now with a smile and a joke and sometimes went so far as to ask my opinions then about six months later came the famous ribblevale case that aroused the moral indignation of so many persons among whom was perry blackwood you know as well as i do hugh how this thing is being manipulated he declared at tom's one sunday evening there was nothing the matter with the ribblevale steel company it was as right as rain before leonard dickinson and gerson and scherer and that crowd you train with began to talk it down at the club oh they're very compassionate i've heard em dickinson privately doesn't think much of ribblevale paper and pew the president of the ribblevale seems worried and looks badly it's all very clever but i'd hate to tell you in plain words what i'd call it go ahead i challenged him audaciously you haven't any proof that the ribblevale wasn't in trouble i heard mr pugh tell my father the other day it was a damned outrage he couldn't catch up with these rumours and some of his stockholders were liquidating you don't suppose pugh would want to admit his situation do you i asked pugh's a straight man retorted perry that's more than i can say for any of the other gang saving your presence the unpleasant truth is that scherer and the boyne people want the ripple veil and you ought to know it if you don't he looked at me very hard through the glasses he had lately taken to wearing tom who was lounging by the fire shifted his position uneasily i smiled and took another cigar i believe ralph is right parry when he calls you a sentimentalist for you there's a tragedy behind every ordinary business transaction the Ripplevale people are having a hard time to keep their heads above water, and immediately you smell conspiracy. Dickinson and Scherer have been talking it down. How about it, Tom? But Tom in these debates was inclined to be non-committal, although it was clear they troubled him. Oh, don't ask me, Huey, he said. I suppose I ought to cultivate the scientific point of view, and look with impartial interest at this industrial cannibalism, returned Perry sarcastically. Eat or be eaten, that's what enlightened self-interest has come to. After all, Ralph would say, it is nature, the insect world over again, the victim duped and crippled before he is devoured, and the lawyer, how shall I put it? facilitating the processes of swallowing and digesting there was no use arguing with perry when he was in this vein since i am not writing a technical treatise i need not go into the details of the ribblevale suit suffice it to say that the affair after a while came apparently to a deadlock owing to the impossibility of getting certain definite information from the ribblevale books which had been taken out of the state the treasurer for reasons of his own remained out of the state also the ordinary course of summoning him before a magistrate in another state had naturally been resorted to 
but the desired evidence was not forthcoming the trouble is mr watling explained to mr scherer that there is no law in the various states with a sufficient penalty attached that will compel the witness to divulge facts he wishes to conceal it was the middle of a february afternoon and they were seated in deep leather chairs in one corner of the reading-room of the boing club they had the place to themselves founds was there also one leg twisted round the other in familiar fashion a bored look on his long and sallow face mr watling had telephoned to the office for me to bring them some papers bearing on the case sit down hugh he said kindly now we have present a genuine legal mind said mr scherer in the playful manner he had adopted of late while i grinned appreciatively and took a chair mr watling presently suggested kidnapping the ribblevale treasurer until he should promise to produce the books as the only way out of what seemed an impasse but mr scherer brought down a huge fist on his knee i tell you it is no joke watling we've got to win that suit he asserted that's all very well replied mr watling but we're a respectable firm you know we haven't had to resort to safe blowing as yet mr scherer shrugged his shoulders as much as to say it were a matter of indifference to him what methods were resorted to mr watling's eyes met mine his glance was amused yet i thought i read in it a query as to the advisability in my presence of going too deeply into the question of ways and means i may have been wrong at any rate its sudden effect was to embolden me to give voice to an idea that had begun to simmer in my mind that excited me and yet i had feared to utter it this look of my chief's and the lighter tone the conversation had taken decided me why wouldn't it be possible to draw up a bill to fit the situation i inquired mr watling started what do you mean he asked quickly all three looked at me i felt the blood come into my face but it was too late to draw back well the legislature is in session and since as mr watling says there is no sufficient penalty in other states to compel the witness to produce the information desired why not draw up a bill and and have it passed i paused for breath imposing a sufficient penalty on home corporations in the event of such evasions the ripplevale steel company is a home corporation i had shot my bolt there followed what was for me an anxious silence while the three of them continued to stare at me mr watling put the tips of his fingers together and i became aware that he was not offended that he was thinking rapidly by george why not founds he demanded well said founds there's an element of risk in such a proceeding i need not dwell upon risk cried the senior partner vigorously there's risk in everything they'll howl of course but they howl anyway and nobody ever listens to them they'll say it's special legislation and the pilot will print sensational editorials for a few days but what of it all of that has happened before i tell you if we can't see those books we'll lose the suit that's in black and white and as a matter of justice we're entitled to know what we want to know there might be two opinions as to that observed founds with his sardonic smile mr watling paid no attention to this remark he was already deep in thought it was characteristic of his mind to leap forward seize a suggestion that often appeared chimerical to a man like founds and turn it into an accomplished fact i believe you've hit it hugh he said we needn't bother about the powers of the courts in other states we'll put into this bill an appeal to our court for an order on the clerk to compel the witness to come before the court and testify and we'll provide for a special commissioner to take depositions in the state where the witness is if the officers of a home corporation who are outside of the state refuse to testify the penalty will be that the ration goes into the hands of a receiver founds whistled that's going some he said well we've got to go some how about it scherer 
even mr scherer's brown eyes were snapping we've got to win that suit vatling we were all excited even found i think though he remained expressionless ours was the tense excitement of primitive man in chase the quarry which had threatened to elude us was again in view and not unlikely to fall into our hands add to this feeling on my part the thrill that it was i who had put them on the scent i had all the sensations of an aspiring young brave who for the first time is admitted to the councils of the tribe it ought to be a popular bill too mr scherer was saying with a smile of ironic appreciation at the thought of demagogues advocating it we should have one of lawler's friends introduce it oh we shall have it properly introduced replied mr watling it may come back at us suggested founds pessimistically the boyne ironworks is a home corporation too if i'm not mistaken the boyne ironworks has the firm of watling founds and ripon behind it asserted mr scherer with what struck me as a magnificent faith you mustn't forget parrot mr watling reminded him with a wink at me we had risen mr scherer laid a hand on my arm no no i do not forget him he will not permit me to forget him a remark i thought that betrayed some insight into my character mr watling called for pen and paper and made then and there a draft of the proposed bill for no time was to be lost it was dark when we left the club and i recall the elation i felt and strove to conceal as i accompanied my chief back to the office the stenographers and clerks were gone alone in the library we got down the statutes and set to work to perfect the bill from the rough draft on which mr founds had written his suggestions i felt that a complete yet subtle change had come over my relationship with mr watling in the midst of our labours he asked me to call up the attorney for the railroad mr gorse was still at his office hello is that you miller mr watling said this is watling when can i see you for a few minutes this evening yes i'm leaving for washington at nine thirty eight o'clock all right i'll be there it was almost eight before he got the draft finished to his satisfaction and i had picked it out on the typewriter as i handed it to him my chief held it a moment gazing at me with an odd smile you seem to have acquired a good deal of useful knowledge here and there hugh he observed i have tried to keep my eyes open mr watling i said well he said there are a great many things a young man practising law in these days has to learn for himself and if i hadn't given you credit for some cleverness i shouldn't have wanted you here there's only one way to look at at these matters we have been discussing my boy that's the common-sense way and if a man doesn't get that point of view by himself nobody can teach it to him i needn't enlarge upon it no sir i said he smiled again but immediately became serious if mr gore should approve of this bill i'm going to send you down to the capital to-night can you go i nodded i want you to look out for the bill in the legislature of course there won't be much to do except to stand by but you will get a better idea of what goes on down there i thanked him and told him i would do my best i'm sure of that he replied now it's time to go see gorse the legal department of the railroad occupied an entire floor of the corn bank building i had often been there on various errands having on occasions delivered sealed envelopes to mr gorse himself approaching him in the ordinary way through a series of offices but now following mr watling through the dimly lighted corridor we came to a door on which no name was painted and which was presently opened by a stenographer there was in the proceeding a touch of mystery that revived keenly my boyish love for romance brought back the days when i had been in turn captain kidd and ali baba i have never realized more strongly than in that moment the psychological force of prestige little by little for five years an estimate of the extent of miller gorse's power had been coming home to me 
and his features stood in my mind for his particular kind of power he was a tremendous worker and often remained in his office until ten and eleven at night he dismissed the stenographer by the wave of a hand which seemed to thrust her bodily out of the room hello miller said mr watling hello theodore replied mr gorse this is parrot of my office i know said mr gorse and nodded toward me i was impressed by the felicity with which a cartoonist of the pilot had once caricatured him by the use of curved lines the circle of the heavy eyebrows ended at the wide nostrils the mouth was a crescent but bowed downwards the heavy shoulders were rounded indeed the only straight line to be discerned about him was that of his hair black as bitumen banged across his forehead even his polished porphyry eyes were constructed on some curvilinear principle and had never seemed to focus it might be said of mr gorse that he had an overwhelming impersonality one could never quite be sure that one's words reached the mark in spite of the intimacy which i knew existed between them in my presence at least mr gorse's manner was little different with mr watling than it was with other men mr watling did not seem to mind he pulled up a chair close to the desk and began without any preliminaries to explain his errand it's about the ribblevale affair he said you know we have a suit gorse nodded we've got to get at the books miller that's all there is to it i told you so the other day well we've found out a way i think he thrust his hand in his pocket while the railroad attorney remained impassive and drew out the draft of the bill mr gorse read it then read it over again and laid it down in front of him well he said i want to put that through both houses and have the governor's signature to it by the end of the week it seems a little raw at first sight theodore said mr gorse with the suspicion of a smile my chief laughed a little it's not half so raw as some things i might mention that went through like greased lightning he replied what can they do i believe it will hold water talents and most of the other newspapers in the state won't print a line about it and only socialists and populists read the pilot they're disgruntled anyway the point is there's no other way out for us just think a moment bearing in mind what i've told you about the case and you'll see it mr gorse took up the paper again and read the draft over you know as well as i do miller how dangerous it is to leave this ribblevale business at loose ends the carlisle steel people and the lake shore road are after the ribblevale company and we can't afford to run any risk of their getting it it's logically a part of the boyne interests as scherer says and dickinson is ready with the money for the reorganization if the carlisle people and the lake shore get it the product will be shipped out by the l and g and the railroad will lose what would barber say mr barber as i have perhaps mentioned was the president of the railroad and had his residence in the other great city of the state he was then i knew in the west we've got to act now insisted mr watling that's open and shut if you have any other plan i wish you'd trot it out if not i want a letter to paul varney and the governor i'm going to send parrot down with them on the night train it was clear to me then in the discussion following that mr watling's gift of persuasion though great was not the determining factor in mr gorse's decision he too possessed boldness though he preferred caution nor did the friendship between the two enter into the transaction i was impressed more strongly than ever with the fact that a lawsuit was seldom a mere private affair between two persons or corporations but involved a chain of relationships and nine times out of ten that chain led up to the railroad which nearly always was vitally interested in these legal contests half an hour of masterly presentation of the situation was necessary before mr gorse became convinced that the introduction of the bill was the only way out for all concerned 
oh i guess you're right theodore he said at length whereupon he seized his pen and wrote off two notes with great rapidity these he showed to mr watling who nodded and returned them they were folded and sealed and handed to me one was addressed to colonel paul varney and the other to the hon w w trulice governor of the state you can trust this young man demanded mr gorse i think so replied mr watling smiling at me the bill was his own idea the railroad attorney wheeled about in his chair and looked at me looked around me would better express it with his indefinite encompassing yet inclusive glance i had riveted his attention and from henceforth i knew i should enter into his calculations he had made for me a compartment in his mind his own idea he repeated i merely suggested it i was putting in when he cut me short aren't you the son of matthew parrot yes i said he gave me a queer glance the significance of which i left untranslated my excitement was too great to analyze what he meant by this mention of my father when we reached the sidewalk my chief gave me a few parting instructions i need scarcely say hugh he added that your presence in the capital should not be advertised as connected with this legislation they will probably attribute it to us in the end but if you're reasonably careful they'll never be able to prove it and there's no use in putting our cards on the table at the beginning no indeed sir i agreed he took my hand and pressed it good luck he said i know you'll get along all right end of section nine section ten of a far country by winston churchill this LibriVox recording is in the public domain book two chapter ten part one this was not my first visit to the state capital indeed some of that recondite knowledge in which i took a pride had been gained on the occasions of my previous visits rising and dressing early i beheld out of the car window the broad shallow river glinting in the morning sunlight the dome of the state house against the blue of the sky even at that early hour groups of the gentlemen who made our laws were scattered about the lobby of the potts house standing or seated within easy reach of the gaily coloured cuspidors that protected the marble floor heavy-jawed workers from the cities mingled with moon-faced but astute countrymen who manipulated votes amongst farms and villages fat or cadaverous irish german or american all bore in common a certain indefinable stamp having eaten my breakfast in a large dining-room that resounded with the clatter of dishes i directed my steps to the apartment occupied from year to year by colonel paul barney generalissimo of the railroad on the legislative battlefield a position that demanded a certain uniqueness of genius how do you do sir he said in a guarded but courteous tone as he opened the door i entered to confront a group of three or four figures silent and rather hostile seated in a haze of tobacco smoke around a marble-topped table on it reposed a bible attached to a chain you probably don't remember me colonel i said my name is parrot and i'm associated with the firm of watling founds and ripon his air of marginality heightened by a grey moustache and goatee a la napoleon third vanished instantly he became hospitable ingratiating why why certainly you were down here with mr founds two years ago the colonel spoke with a slight southern accent to be sure sir i've had the honour of meeting your father mr norris of north haven meet mr parrot one of our rising lawyers i shook hands with them all and sat down opening his long coat colonel varney revealed two rows of cigars suggesting cartridges in a belt these he proceeded to hand out as he talked 
i'm glad to see you here mr parrot you must stay a while and become acquainted with the men who ahem, are shaping the destinies of a great state it would give me pleasure to escort you about i thanked him i had learned enough to realize how important are the amenities in politics and business the colonel did most of the conversing he could not have filled with efficiency and ease the important post that was his had it not been for the endless fund of humorous anecdotes at his disposal one by one the visitors left each assuring me of his personal regard the colonel closed the door softly turning the key in the lock there was a sly look in his black eyes as he took a chair in proximity to mine well mr parrot he asked softly what's up without further ado i handed him mr gorse's letter and another mr watling had given me for him which contained a copy of the bill he read these laid them on the table glancing at me again stroking his goatee the while he chuckled by gum he exclaimed i take off my hat to theodore watling always did he became contemplative it can be done mr parrot but it's going to take some careful driving sir some reaching out and flicking em when they're rar and buck paul varney's never been stumped yet just as soon as this is introduced we'll have gates and armstrong down here they're the ribblevale attorneys aren't they i thought so and the best legal talent they can hire and they'll round up all the disgruntled fellows you know that ain't friendly to the railroad we've got to do it quick mr parrot of course gave you a letter to the governor didn't he yes i said well come along i'll pass the word around among the boys just to let em know what to expect his eyes glittered again i've been following this ripplevale business he added and i understand leonard dickinson's all ready to reorganize the company when the time comes he ought to let me in for a little on the ground floor i did not venture to make any promises for mr dickinson i reckon it's just as well if you were to meet me at the governor's office the colonel added reflectively and the hint was not lost on me it's better not to let em find out any sooner than they have to where this thing comes from you understand he looked at his watch how would nine o'clock do i'll be there with true lease when you come by accident you understand of course he'll be reasonable but when they get to the governor's they have little notions you know and you've got to indulge em flatter em a little it doesn't hurt for when they get their backs up it only makes more trouble he put on a soft black felt hat and departed noiselessly at nine o'clock i arrived at the state house and was ushered into a great square room overlooking the park the governor was seated at a desk under an elaborate chandelier and sure enough colonel varney was there beside him making perceptible signals it is a pleasure to make your acquaintance mr parrot said mr Trulies. your name is a familiar one in your city sir and i gather from your card that you are associated with my good friend theodore watling i acknowledged it i was not a little impressed by the perfect blend of cordiality democratic simplicity and impressiveness mr Trulies had achieved for he had managed in the course of a long political career to combine in exact proportions these elements which in the public mind should up the personality of a chief executive momentarily he overcame the feeling of superiority with which i had entered his presence neutralized the sense i had of being associated now with the higher powers which had put him where he was for i knew all about his record you're acquainted with colonel varney he inquired yes governor i've met the colonel i said well i suppose your firm is getting its share of business these days mr Trulies observed i acknowledged it was and after discussing for a few moments the remarkable growth of my native city the governor tapped on his desk and inquired what he could do for me i produced the letter from the attorney for the railroad the governor read it gravely ah he said from mr gorse 
a copy of the proposed bill was enclosed and the governor read that also hemmed and hawed a little turned and handed it to colonel varney who was sitting with a detached air smoking contemplatively a vacant expression on his face what do you think of this colonel whereupon the colonel tore himself away from his reflections what's that governor mr gorse has called my attention to what seems to him a flaw in our statutes an inability to obtain testimony from corporations whose books are elsewhere and who may thus evade he says to a certain extent the sovereign will of our state the colonel took the paper with an admirable air of surprise adjusted his glasses and became absorbed in reading clearing his throat once or twice and emitting an exclamation well if you ask me governor he said at length all i can say is that i am astonished somebody didn't think of this simple remedy before now many times sir have i seen justice defeated because we had no such legislation as this he handed it back the governor studied it once more and coughed does the penalty he inquired seem to you a little severe no sir replied the colonel emphatically perhaps it is because i am anxious as a citizen to see an evil abated i have had an intimate knowledge of legislation sir for more than twenty years in this state and in all that time i do not remember to have seen a bill more concisely drawn or better calculated to accomplish the ends of justice indeed i often wondered why this very penalty was not imposed foreign magistrates are notoriously indifferent as to affairs in another state than their own rather than go into the hands of a receiver i venture to say that hereafter if this bill is made a law the necessary testimony will be forthcoming the governor read the bill through again if it is introduced colonel he said the legislature and the people of the state ought to have it made clear to them that its aim is to remedy an injustice a misunderstanding on this point would be unfortunate most unfortunate governor and of course added the governor now addressing me it would be improper for me to indicate what course i shall pursue in regard to it if it should come to me for my signature yet i may go so far as to say that the defect it seeks to remedy seems to me a real one come in and see me mr parrot when you are in town and give my cordial regards to mr watling so gravely had the farce been carried on that i almost laughed despite the fact that the matter in question was a serious one for me the governor held out his hand and i accepted my dismissal i had not gone fifty steps in the corridor before i heard the colonel's voice in my ear we had to give him a little rope to go through with his act he whispered confidentially but he'll sign it all right and now if you'll excuse me mr parrot i'll lay a few mines see you at the hotel sir thus he indicated delicately that it would be better for me to keep out of sight on my way to the pot's house the bizarre elements in the situation struck me again with considerable force it seemed so ridiculous so puerile to have to go through with this political farce in order that a natural economic evolution might be achieved without doubt the development of certain industries had reached a stage where the units in competition had become too small when a greater concentration of capital was necessary curiously enough in this mental argument of justification i left out all consideration of the size of the probable profits to mr scherer and his friends profits and brains went together and since the almighty did not limit the latter why should man attempt to limit the former we were playing for high but justifiable stakes and i resented the comedy which a hypocritical insistence on the forms of democracy compelled us to go through it seemed unworthy of men who controlled the destinies of state and nation the point of view however was consoling as the day wore on i sat in the colonel's room admiring the skill with which he conducted the campaign 
a green country lawyer had been got to introduce the bill it had been expedited to the committee on the judiciary which would have an executive session immediately after dinner i had ventured to inquire about the hearings there won't be any hearing sir the colonel assured me we own that committee from top to bottom indeed by four o'clock in the afternoon the message came that the committee had agreed to recommend the bill shortly after that the first flurry occurred there came a knock at the door followed by the entrance of a stocky irish american of about forty years of age whose black hair was plastered over his forehead his sea-blue eyes had a stormy look hello jim said the colonel i was just wondering where you were sure you must then replied the gentleman sarcastically but the colonel's geniality was unruffled mr maker he said you ought to know mr parrot mr maker is a representative from ward five of your city and we can always count on him to do the right thing even if he is a democrat how about it jim mr maker relighted the stump of his cigar take a fresh one jim said the colonel opening a bureau drawer mr maker took two say colonel he demanded what's this bill that went into the judiciary this morning what bill asked the colonel blandly so you think i ain't on mr maker inquired the colonel laughed where have you been jim i've been up to the city seen my wife that's where i've been the colonel smiled as at a harmless fiction well if you weren't here i don't see what right you've got to complain i never leave my good democratic friends on the outside do i that's all right replied mr maker doggedly i'm on i'm here now and that bill in the judiciary doesn't pass without me i guess i can stop it too how about a thousand apiece for five of us boys you're pretty good at a joke jim remarked the colonel stroking his goatee maybe you're looking for a little publicity in this here game retorted mr maker darkly say colonel ain't we always treated the railroad on the level jim asked the colonel gently didn't i always take care of you he had laid his hand on the shoulder of mr maker who appeared slightly mollified and glanced at a massive silver watch well i'll be dropping in about eight o'clock was his significant reply as he took his leave i guess we'll have to grease the wheels a little the colonel remarked to me and gazed at the ceiling the telegram apropos of the ward five leader was by no means the only cipher message i sent back during my stay i had not needed to be told that the matter in hand would cost money but mr watling's parting instruction to me had been to take the colonel's advice as to specific sums and obtain confirmation from founds nor was it any surprise to me to find democrats on intimate terms with such a stout republican as the colonel some statesman is said to have declared that he knew neither easterners nor westerners northerners nor southerners but only americans so colonel varney recognized neither democrats nor republicans in our legislature party divisions were sunk in a greater loyalty to the railroad at the colonel's suggestion i had laid in a liberal supply of cigars and whiskey the scene in his room that evening suggested a session of a sublimated grand lodge of some secret order such were the mysterious comings and goings knocks and suspenses one after another the important men duly appeared and were introduced the colonel supplying the light touch why cuss me if it isn't billy mr parrot i want you to shake hands with mr donovan the floor leader of the opposition sir mr donovan has the habit of coming up here for a friendly chat ever since he first came down to the legislature how long is it billy i guess it's nigh on to fifteen years colonel fifteen years echoed the colonel and he's so good a democrat it hasn't changed his politics a particle mr donovan grinned in appreciation of this thrust helping himself liberally from the bottle on the mantel and took a seat on the bed we had a friendly chat 
thus i made the acquaintance also of the hon joseph mecklin speaker of the house who unbent in the most flattering way on learning my identity mr parrott's here on that little matter representing watling founds and ripon the colonel explained and it appeared that mr mecklin knew all about the little matter and that the mention of the firm of watling founds and ripon had a magical effect in these parts the president of the senate the hon leif giddings went so far as to say that he hoped before long to see mr watling in washington by no means the least among our callers was the hon fitch truesdale editor of the st helen's messenger whose editorials were of the trite effectiveness that is taken widely for wisdom and were assiduously copied every week by other state papers and labelled mr truesdale's common sense at countless firesides in our state he was known as the spokesman of the plain man who was blissfully ignorant of the fact that mr truesdale was owned body and carcass by mr cyrus ridden the principal manufacturer of st helens and a director in several subsidiary lines of the railroad in the legislature the hon fitch's function was that of the moderate councillor and bellwether for new members hence nothing could have been more fitting than the choice of that gentleman for the honour of moving on the morrow that bill number seven hundred nine ought to pass mr truesdale reluctantly consented to accept a small loan that would help to pay the mortgage on his new press when the last of the gathering had departed about one o'clock in the morning i had added considerably to my experience gained a pretty accurate idea of who was who in the legislature and politics of the state and established relationships as the colonel reminded me likely to prove valuable in the future it seemed only gracious to congratulate him on his management of the affair so far he appeared pleased and squeezed my hand well sir it did require a little delicacy of touch and if i do say it myself it hasn't been botched he admitted there ain't an outsider as far as i can learn who has caught on to the nigger in the woodpile that's the great thing to keep em ignorant as long as possible you understand they yell bloody murder when they do find out but generally it's too late if a bill's been handled right i found myself speculating as to who the outsiders might be no ripplevale attorneys were on the spot as yet of that i was satisfied in the absence of these who were the opposition it seemed to me as though i had interviewed that day every man in the legislature i was very tired but when i got into bed it was impossible to sleep my eyes smarted from the tobacco smoke and the events of the day in disorderly manner kept running through my head the tide of my exhilaration had ebbed and i found myself struggling against a revulsion caused apparently by the contemplation of colonel varney and his associates the instruments in brief by which our triumph over our opponents was to be effected and that same idea which when launched amidst the surroundings of the boyne club had seemed so brilliant now took on an aspect of tawdriness another thought intruded itself that of mr pugh the president of the ripplevale company my father had known him and some years before i had travelled half-way across the state in his company his kindliness had impressed me he had spent a large part of his business life i knew in building up the ripplevale and now it was to be wrested from him he was to be set aside perhaps forced to start all over again when old age was coming on in vain i accused myself of sentimentality and summoned all my arguments to prove that in commerce efficiency must be the only test the image of mr pugh would not down i got up and turned on the light and took refuge in a novel i had in my bag presently i grew calmer i had chosen i had succeeded and now that i had my finger at last on the nerve of power it was no time to weaken it was half-past six when i awoke and went to the window 
relieved to find that the sun had scattered my morbid fancies with the darkness and i speculated as i dressed whether the thing called conscience were not after all a matter of nerves i went downstairs through the tobacco stale atmosphere of the lobby into the fresh air and sparkly sunlight of the mild february morning and leaving the business district i reached the residence portion of the little town the front steps of some of the comfortable houses were being swept by industrious servant girls and out of the chimneys twisted fantastically rich blue smoke the bare branches of the trees were silver-gray against the sky gaining at last an old-fashioned wooden bridge i stood for a while gazing at the river over the shallows of which the spendthrift hand of nature had flung a shower of diamonds and i reflected that the world was for the strong for him who dared reach out his hand and take what it offered it was not money we coveted we americans but power the self-expression conferred by power a single experience such as i had had the night before would serve to convince any sane man that democracy was a failure that the world-old principle of aristocracy would assert itself that the attempt of our ancestors to curtail political power had merely resulted in the growth of another and greater economic power that bade fair to be limitless as i walked slowly back into town i felt a reluctance to return to the noisy hotel and finding myself in front of a little restaurant on a side street i entered it there was but one other customer in the place and he was seated on the far side of the counter with a newspaper in front of him and while i was ordering my breakfast i was vaguely aware that the newspaper had dropped and that he was looking at me in the slight interval that elapsed before my brain could register his identity i experienced a distinct shock of resentment a sense of the re-intrusion of an antagonistic value at a moment when it was most unwelcome the man had risen and was coming around the counter he was herman krebs parrot i heard him say you here i exclaimed he did not seem to notice the lack of cordiality in my tone he appeared so genuinely glad to see me again that i instantly became rather ashamed of my ill-nature yes i'm here in the legislature he informed me a salon exactly he smiled and you he inquired oh i'm only a spectator down here for a day or two he was still lanky his clothes gave no evidence of an increased prosperity but his complexion was good his skin had cleared i was more than ever taken by a resolute good humour a simplicity that was not innocence a whimsical touch seemingly indicative of a state of mind that refused to take too seriously certain things on which i set store what right had he to be contented with life well i too am only a spectator here he laughed i'm neither fish flesh nor fowl nor good red herring you were going into the law weren't you i asked i remember you said something about it that day we met at beverly farms yes i managed it after all then i went back home to elkington to try to make a living but somehow i have never thought of you as being likely to develop political aspirations krebs i said i should say not he exclaimed yet here you are launched upon a political career how did it happen oh i'm not worrying about the career he assured me i got here by accident and i'm afraid it won't happen again in a hurry you see the hands in those big mills we have in elkington sprang a surprise on the machine and the first thing i knew i was nominated for the legislature a committee came to my boarding-house and told me and there was the deuce to pay right off the railroad politicians turned in and worked for the democratic candidate of course and the hutchinses who owned the mills tried through emissaries to intimidate their operatives and then i asked well i'm here he said wouldn't you be accomplishing more i inquired if you hadn't antagonized the hutchinses it depends upon what you mean by accomplishment he answered 
so mildly that i felt more rude than ever well from what you say i suppose you're going in for reform that these workmen up at elkington are not satisfied with their conditions and imagine you can help to better them now provided the conditions are not as good as they might be how are you going to improve them if you find yourself isolated here as you say in other words i should cooperate with colonel varney and other disinterested philanthropists he supplied and i realized that i was losing my temper well what can you do i inquired defiantly i can find out what's going on he said i've already learned something by the way and then i asked wondering whether the implication were personal then i can help disseminate the knowledge i may be wrong but i have an idea that when the people of this country learn how their legislatures are conducted they will want to change things that's right echoed the waiter who had come up with my griddle cakes and you're the man to tell him mr krebs it will need several thousand of us to do that i'm afraid said krebs returning his smile my distaste for the situation became more acute but i felt that i was thrown on the defensive i could not retreat now i think you're wrong i declared when the waiter had departed to attend to another customer the people the great majority of them at least are indifferent they don't want to be bothered with politics there will always be labor agitation of course the more wages those fellows get the more they want we pay the highest wages in the world to-day and the standard of living is higher in this country than anywhere else they'd ruin our prosperity if we let them how about the thousands of families who don't earn enough to live decently even in times of prosperity inquired krebs it's hard i'll admit but the inefficient and the shiftless are bound to suffer no matter what form of government you adopt you talk about standards of living i could show you some examples of standards to make your heart sick he said what you don't realize perhaps is that low standards help to increase the inefficient of whom you complain he smiled rather sadly the prosperity you are advocating he added after a moment is a mere fiction it is gorging the few at the expense of the many and what is being done in this country is to store up an explosive gas that some day will blow your superstructure to atoms if you don't wake up in time isn't that a rather one-sided view too i suggested i've no doubt it may appear so but take the proceedings in this legislature i've no doubt you know something about them and that you would maintain they are justified on account of the indifference of the public and of other reasons but i can cite an instance that is simply legalized thieving for the first time a note of indignation crept into krebs's voice last night i discovered by a mere accident in talking to a man who came in on a late train that a bill introduced yesterday which is being rushed through the judiciary committee of the house an apparently innocent little bill will enable if it becomes a law the boyne ironworks of your city to take possession of the ribblevale steel company lock stock and barrel and i am told it was conceived by a lawyer who claims to be a respectable member of his profession and who has extraordinary ability theodore watling krebs put his hand in his pocket and drew out a paper here's a copy of it house bill seven hundred nine his expression suddenly changed perhaps mr watling is a friend of yours i'm with his firm i replied krebs's fingers closed over the paper crumpling it oh then you know about this he said he was putting the paper back into his pocket when i took it from him but my adroitness so carefully schooled seemed momentarily to have deserted me what should i say it was necessary to decide quickly don't you take rather a prejudiced view of this krebs i said upon my word i can't see why you should accept a rumour running around the lobbies that mr watling drafted this bill for a particular purpose he was silent but his eyes did not leave my face 
why should any sensible man a member of the legislature take stock in that kind of gossip i insisted why not judge this bill by its face without heeding a cock and bull story as to how it may have originated it is a good bill or a bad bill let's see what it says i read it so far as i can see it is legislation which we ought to have had long ago and tends to compel a publicity in corporation affairs that is much needed to put a stop to practices which every decent citizen deplores he drew the paper out of my hand you needn't go on parrot he told me it's no use well i'm sorry we don't agree i said and got up i left him twisting the paper in his fingers end of section ten